सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली the expectation is a cutter clutter episode on what's happening in israel and around it and it's a fair expectation because this is the biggest story in the world right now dominates everything not only does it dominate international affairs but also also greatly affects the domestic politics of many nations not just in the middle east or in the periphery of israel but also big capitals of the world this is this is the big event in fact in some ways it's about about as important as the war in ukraine now we know that the war in ukraine involved two superpowers it involved russia a military superpower a qualified military superpower not not a super a superpower otherwise and nato at the other end this however is a european a western enclave in asia that is israel and that's now under attack and the us and also with that the western alliance are all sworn to protecting israel and the israelis themselves are are quite well equipped to fight to to fight back not just fight back but to but to also launch war so they have now responded to the attacks by hamas which is not a state hamas is a militant organization it's a fundamentalist militant organization now globally acknowledged to be a terrorist organization right a distinction is made between hamas and the palestinian authority which sits at ramallah so those palestinians we don't use the expression terrorist for them but hamas is a terrorist organization on that there is very little argument globally now hamas has launched this surprise attack on israel surprise effective and for the moment for the first 24 hours very successful evidence of that you have seen on your tv screens and now you are seeing the numbers numbers of the dead and the wounded that's coming out and you are seeing retaliations also how have the israelis responded to this so i can do no better than to quote yoav gallant who is the defense minister of israel who says war this is war for our existence in the region and there will be steps that have never been seen before and then he announced a full blockade of gaza which is which is a small strip you can see it on the map as such israel is a very small country and geographies in that region are very small but gaza in particular is a small strip it's not landlocked it opens out to the mediterranean but on the land on one side it is it it is linked to israel on the other egypt so the dependence on outside support on outside economic and food and electricity for gaza for gazans is enormous now that gaza has been blockaded by israelis that's what the israeli defense minister said he also said there will be no food no fuel no electricity and then bombing has gone on you see many pictures you will see some of your screen as i speak these are night time bombings being carried out by israeli air force and long range artillery on gaza apparently or the claim is that these are targeting hamas commanders and hamas control centers at the same time in built up areas it's very difficult to say what is where so if a whole building is brought down a whole tower is brought down as happened the first day a bunch of towers were brought down it was said for example that hamas radio was operating from one of those hamas radio station was operating from one of those so a warning is given out just a little bit earlier for people to vacate the building and then the entire building is brought down so it's a lot of destruction and you, you can see that destruction on your screens now all of this is happening all of this is now all of this is happening and it raises many questions so the challenge for me was the challenge for me was that i can go on i mean where do you how do you consolidate what you're going to say so first of all this is a big story it's going to be with us for the next few days so the chances are that next 
couple of days, three days, maybe, maybe even four, Cut the Clutter episodes will focus on certain aspects or some aspects of what's going on in this region and around Israel. That's why it's important for me to compartmentalize at least for today, what I'm going to speak about. So for today, I would say, let's look at five questions. Five questions, what happened? Two, what went wrong? Three, how, did, how does Hamas justify this? Four, what's the global reaction where India stands? And five, what may happen? Now, these are five good questions. The first question, we know what happened. Uh, all of you know what happened, that Hamas, already, uh, Hamas invaded Israeli mainland. This is not, these are not settlements, Israeli settlements, Jewish settlements on the West Bank. This is the Israeli mainland, Israeli ma mainland as Israel inherited in 1948. It is that mainland. So Gazans broke through the wall or the fence that the Israelis have built along their border with Gaza. It's a very expensive barrier. It cost more than a billion dollars and given how small the geography is, how little the distance is, it's a lot of money. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the Gazans broke through it or came over it in hang gliders or in some cases motorized gliders. Many came in through the through the tunnels that they've been building and many then, once they had got the breakthrough, many then drove bulldozers into the fence and broke it and came across it. This came on the day of the big, big annual festival in Israel. So everybody was essentially asleep. And the formidable Israeli army, the very formidable Israeli army and the intelligence agencies were taken by surprise. So that's what we know. Then we know that some of these, some of these glider-born, Terrorists reached a rave festival that was taking place, killed a lot of people there who were just dancing, enjoying themselves. They were not, are not expecting to be attacked. Also, these attacks took place in the area of Israel where security in depth is not that heavy because people are not, not expecting to be attacked in these areas. Jewish settlements on the West Bank, for example, People are armed. Jewish settlers are armed because they are expecting to be attacked anytime. Not in this area because this is the Israeli mainland. So this is what happened and then we know the Israelis have been retaliating since then. Now the question is what went wrong? Because the whole world lays such store by Israeli intelligence, Mossad, Israeli armed forces. How could this have gone wrong? Because Israelis know that they live in a tough environment. They've seen many wars before. In fact, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant now says this is a war for our existence in, in the region. The fact is that Israelis have forever been fighting wars for their existence in the region. And I'm, and I'm not even taking you back to the 1960s or the 1950s, but say look at the, look at the last 20 years, 2006, 2008-9, 2012, 2014, 2018, 2019, 2022. That is when Trouble took place at Al-Aqsa Mosque, following which there were lots of attacks on Israeli settlements, etc. So Israelis have been always fighting for what they see as their existence. So for a country in that situation and for a country which takes pride in producing the best technology in the world for intelligence, espionage, surveillance, how did they go wrong? So I'm, le I'm leaning on an Israeli an award-winning, a top award-winning Israeli journalist and commentator, Nahun Barnia. Nahun Barnia is writing in a paper called Yedioth Aronoth. And he says that four blunders have taken place. Four blunders. What are these blunders? One is intelligence failure. Two, how was the border breached? Because after all, you have this fence with all these protections. How was the border breached? Three, how did Hamas manage to take hostages back into Gaza? How were they not stopped before that? And four, why were Israeli defense forces so slow in their reaction? And then he explains, first of all, he says intelligence ignored many warnings that existed even earlier. So he says, first of all, intelligence failure lies in the fact, not because Hamas was so clever that the Israelis never found out, but because there were many indications, but just as it happened in 1973, Yom Kippur War, that there were many indications that Egyptians may be launching an attack, Israeli intelligence dismissed it as just idle training, that people are training, if people are training to use 
hang gliders or motorized gliders, you would normally think, what are they planning, right? But in this case, Israeli intelligence probably concluded that this was just idle training. This will, this will not yield to, this will not lead to anything. Again, this is a fence. It's a very expensive fence. I told you it's more than a billion dollars worth. In fact, in fact, Yedioth Aronoth's article says 3.5 billion shekels. It's a very expensive fence. It's an expensive fence with sensors above it, under it, on it, right? And cameras and technologies everywhere. Important thing is it's an unmanned fence because you rely so much in technology and alarms that if anybody tries to cross it, touch it, come near it, there'll be an alarm and somebody will wake up and somebody will wake up and immediately take action. Now, that is that is brilliant. That is excellent as long as you are only seeing a threat from the odd infiltrator. The odd infiltrator or a group of terrorists, maybe four, five, six, ten, who are trying to cross the, cr cross the fence and come in. Because even if they cross it, you can catch them somewhere because you will have an alarm. You are not prepared for people coming in, large masses of people coming in on their own vehicles, on bulldozers, and literally, literally crushing this fence and coming into your territory. For that, they were not ready. So that's what happened. The, that is the first two failures. The intelligence failures, where indications were there, but everybody thought it was just idle training. And two, how the border was breached. So Nahun Barnia also, also points out to the fact that so many of these people came in and IDF seemed to be in such deep sleep and so complacent that bands of these terrorists were walking around one of the big armored core tank bases of Israeli army as if they are own. You've seen those pictures of Hamas having taken away an Israeli main battle tank. So he said they were walking around an armored core base as if theirs. And then I quote from him, from uh, and then I quote from him, that is Nahun Barnia, who says, and I quote, I suddenly felt like I do not live in Israel, which I am proud of, but in Somalia. So these are very strong words. So what went wrong? Second question is answered with these four failures that we just described for you. Third question, how did Hamas justify this and motivate people? Because after all, all these people coming in would have known that chances of their going back alive or going back as free people are very poor. Some who went back with hostages, yes, they escaped. How long for and how long do they live? I don't know because they will be, Israelis will reign hell over Gaza now and they've been doing it already. But Hamas had a war cry and that war cry we understand from the, from the name that they chose for this operation. They called this operation Tufan Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is the name of the mosque in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem. Al-Aqsa, also Dome of the Rock. We'll talk about that for a couple of minutes just now. But Al-Aqsa is the second of second holiest place for Muslims. Now, Al-Aqsa is where for the past two years, clashes between Israeli security forces and Palestinian, Palestinian Muslims break out routinely at Al-Aqsa. But last two years, 2022 and 2023, in the month of Ramzan, Ramzan, clashes have been really bad. And I will I will talk about, talk about those clashes in just a minute. But it is because of those grievances it was riding those grievances that Israeli security forces were much too tough and brutal with Muslim Muslims praying at one of their holiest mosques during the month of Ramzan. That that Hamas was able to that Hamas was able to motivate their cadres, and that's also one of the reasons that Hamas and its operations are finding such wide support in the Islamic world. Now, of course. Whenever any operation is carried out by any any Palestinians, any Palestinian any Palestinians means there are two two kinds of Palestinian forces in that area. One is Palestinians who live under the Palestinian Authority, which is headquartered at Ramallah. The other is the Palestinians living in Gaza. Now, any time any clash takes place between Palestinians and the Israelis irrespective of who starts it, there is sympathy in the Muslim world. There is also a sympathy, great sympathy among left parties and left intellectuals across the world. That is, that is a well-known thing. 
So Hamas has also pegged its entire operation, everything they've done on what's been happening in Al-Aqsa Mosque. So if you go to social media and you see pictures of Israelis who've been killed, who've been maimed, who've been taken as hostages, who are being beaten, dragged by their hair, women being dragged by their hair and taken as hostages. So immediately the response you get from social media, from from critics of Israelis that see, this is what the Israeli armed forces have been doing to unarmed Arabs, unarmed devout Arabs, including women, old women, children in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, there is a difference of degree, but when passions are hot and they get and they, and they start clashing, then nobody looks at nuance. So that is how that is how Hamas has been able to justify it to the larger support base of Palestinians across the world or the larger community of Israeli critics across the world, but also to motivate their own cadres. Now, in our episode 744, that was three years back, almost three years back, we had explained to you what Al-Aqsa Mosque is and what is the what is the complexity of East Jerusalem. That is when the Sheikh Jarrah riots had broken out. Now I will I will once again explain this to you because Al-Aqsa is so central to this. Al-Aqsa is not close to where Gaza is. In fact, I will share with you a map that our people have drawn, my, my colleagues have drawn, that tells you the map of Israel where Gaza is located and the respective range of many missiles that the that the Hamas has. So that also tells you where East Jerusalem is. So Al-Aqsa is located there. Now, Jerusalem, 1948, when there was a war between the Jews who were coming in, Jewish settlers who were, who were coming in, at that point mostly from Europe because they were escaping the Holocaust and they wanted, they want, they had been promised a country of their own which is now Israel and also Arabs who were living there and Arabs who came in from outside. So, so at the conclusion of that war, Jerusalem was divided. West Jerusalem remained with the Israelis. East Jerusalem was not with the Israelis. It was a kind of mixed control, right? It was for a, it was until 1967, mostly not in Israeli control. And there was a lot of fighting between people and there was a lot of firing and there was a lot of exchange of fire between Israeli soldiers on the on, in West Jerusalem and from Palestinian fighters in the East. In the Six Day War of 1967, Israelis went and took over East Jerusalem. But the status of East Jerusalem still remains, still remains uncertain because that is where the Arab population, the Palestinians are still very strong. And around that area, there are still many areas and around that and around that geography, there are still many areas which are under the Palestinian Authority. And that's where clashes break out often. Now, once again, if you come to Al-Aqsa Mosque, Al-Aqsa in a way means the last mosque or the most distant mosque. The story is when the Prophet started from the holy mosques of Makkah and Medina, he came as far as Jerusalem. And it is from here, it is from here, from the, the shrine, very picturesque shrine, you will see a picture called Dome of the Rock, that it is from here, that the Prophet ascended to heaven to meet Allah on his, on his lightning horse, went in and came back very quickly because Allah then introduced him also to many of the other Prophets who were there, including Prophet Jesus, Prophet Adam and all the others, Prophet Jacob, Jacob and came back. It is also the place which is holy to Jews because Jews think this is where Abraham offered his son in sacrifice to God, but God revealed himself and intervened and didn't let him do it. Once again, remember these three great faiths, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And I'm not, I'm not listing them like this in any order of importance or any order of preference. I'm only listing them chronologically because Judaism came first, then came Christianity and then came Islam. For all three of them, this little piece of real estate is, is their holiest real estate or among their holiest real estates. For the Jews, their second temple, which was built by Herod in 516 BCE and was destroyed in 70 CE by the Romans, that stood there. It is on top of that second temple of the Jews that Dome of the Rock is located. So this is really 
Babri Masjid Ram Janabhumi multiplied several times over. And remember, just walking distance, just walking distance, maybe maybe on a clear maybe if you don't don't have many people on the street just a few minutes away is the church of holy sepulchre that's where that's where jesus christ was crucified and resurrected so for jews christians and muslims this little place is there among their holiest places and definitely the most disputed for all three faiths the shrine itself, the shrine itself, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, been built and re rebuilt several times. 8th century AD, a prayer hall was built by Omar II, the second caliph of the Rashidun Caliphate, in the place where it was said that the Prophet prayed before he ascended to the heaven and came back on his lightning horse, the Burak. Then subsequently, Abdul Malik, who was the fifth caliph in the Umayyad Caliphate. He built a larger structure there, 1033 Dome of the Rock or the, or the Shrine of Dome of the Rock or the mosque took shape. The mosque has been there since then and you know what happens? Because anytime there is festival season, just as it used to happen in the days of communal riots in our country, in this place, if, if the month of Ramzan coincides with the Jewish month of Jewish week of Passover, then people go in the same area to pray, etc. And you know, who has the state power? It's the Israelis of the state power and clashes took place and, and clashes take place. So 2022, the month of Ramzan was April 2 to May 2. Trouble had started there even earlier before the month of Ramzan began. So April 2 to May 2 was the month of Ramzan. April 15 to April 23, was the week of Passover. Easter was April 17. I told you all three Abrahamic faiths. It's an irony. All faiths, all three faiths are Abrahamic faiths and all three at this point are contesting this space. The Christians are not, are, are not in this trouble right now. It is entirely the Muslims and the Jews. 2022 clashes took place again Israeli army security forces went in. There was a lot of beating, use of use of rubber bullets, etc. And then there were reprisals by Palestinians. So many Jewish settlements were attacked. In that melee of stuff that happened, that followed after the Al-Aqsa action in 2022, 17 Israelis were killed. 17 Jewish Israelis were killed. Once again this year, 2023, the month of Ramzan was 22nd March to 20th April. You know, every every year Ramzan comes about two weeks earlier. So this month, this year in 2023, Ramzan was 22nd March to 20th April. Passover was 5th April to 12th April and Easter was 9th April. So once again, trouble broke out on 15th of April. And those pictures then of trouble that went around the entire world, particularly the Muslim world, particularly the Palestinian world, and they were then very useful fuel, emotional fuel in the hands of the Hamas. Now, fourth question, what's the global reaction? What's the global reaction? We've seen that the entire Western world has condemned this. Entire Western world has condemned, condemned this unequivocally. In fact, in the Western world, nobody has said anything about what we might call as root causes. Because you know what happens when we in India get hit by terrorists coming in from Pakistan, somebody reminds us of root causes. You haven't settled the Kashmir problem or you did this in Ayodhya or Babri Masjid or you did this in such and such place. We say this is nonsense. This is, don't give us the root causes theory. When 26-11 happened, Bombay was attacked. UPA was in power. UPA government also completely dismissed out of hand anybody who would have said root causes. What, what about the root causes of this problem? Just because you have a problem in Kashmir, you can't just come anywhere, in this case Mumbai, and start killing innocent people. So there is no root causes justification. So all of the Western world, a lot of the other world, there is no root causes justification. Most of the other world, China included, Russia in fact, almost sounds like they are partisan towards Hamas without quite saying so. China, very equivocal, basically following the root causes theory. All of the global south, 
all of the global south so called global south that has been that is that has painted such big time on modi government's discourse lately all of the global south is either fence sitting or sitting the other side of the fence from israel saying resolve the palestinian issue first that's also surprisingly the line that congress working committee has taken modi government's line is clearly stated in this tweet by narendra modi prime minister himself and see that tweet on your screen in fact if you see this tweet and then i will contrast this with the tweet by justin trudeau the canadian prime minister with whom india now ha has very many differences you will find that essentially both are saying the same thing so india's official reaction to this is unequivocal of support to israel and india calls india joins the western world in calling hamas terrorists there is no qualification there at all not the congress party and congress party is the major opposition party is the main opposition party so we have to take that into account now at one ironical level this also tells you that if india is isolated at all it's isolated in the global south whose leadership it's been seeking all this while i would say not very wisely and i wrote a whole national interest article on this of which i will again share a link with you both of the text version and the video version but generally the western world fully with israel the most important response i have seen them the most most important response i have seen and in fact the most telling is from the british labor party british labor party has been having its annual convention and i saw their response on al jazeera and the bbc and i found the reporters anchors trying to get a response out of their spokesperson labor party spokesperson saying that labor party spokesperson said that our party believes this is terrorism there is no justification for terrorism this violence is appalling i am quoting the verbatim this is terrorism there is no justification for terrorism this violence is appalling and even when the even when the anchors try to ask them try to take them towards the palestinian issue saying but this has other causes how do we are you thinking of addressing other causes the labor party spokesperson said those will be discussed later those will be discussed in the future right now what's happened is a terrorist attack violence is appalling and israel has fully the right to defend itself that that is the g7 western alliances reaction where support for israel is cut across party and ideological lines it's in india however that is, that 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 this response remains divided but also the interesting point is an important point is that india's official reaction is exactly the same exactly the same as that of the western world which brings us to the final question what may happen now i will share with you a long article a 2021 article by anthony cordesman who is one of the foremost and senior most strategic affairs expert sitting in washington is currently emeritus chair in strategy and arle berk chair in strategy at center for strategic and international studies csis so i've taken this paper from the csis website i will share a link to the full paper with you please check it out read it patiently but basically five points that he has made and i will leave it at that number 1 he says that 2000 wars in 2006 2008 9 2012 2014 2018 2019 2022 have shown that israeli might israeli armed forces are formidable but they've been unable to decisively degrade the terrorist firepower or manpower or the ability of the terrorists to strike at israel number 2 that israel has overwhelming military advantage but in built up areas that advantage is neutralized because built up area is built up areas are unpredictable and that is something limitations of modern armies to operate in built up areas have been shown with the us armed forces in afghanistan and iraq and gaza as you know is fully built up also built up areas really degrade technology because technology works when you have open ground but if you are go going from house to house apartment to apartment street to street technology still helps but technology does degrade it very fast and the technological 
advantage is not the same as it might be in conventional warfare. Number three, Iron Dome, which Israel uses, is great. It's very expensive. It's great. But the fact is that Hamas is also improving. And Hamas has large quantities of these rackets. And, and as Joseph Stalin famously said, something like quantity itself is a quality. Fourth point from Cordesman, stalemate is bad for all. That there should be a solution. But to think that there can be an Arab-Israeli deal bypassing the Palestinians, it's not going to happen. That's unsustainable. You will have to get the Palestinians on board for any deal or any settlement. It's not as, as if the Saudis and the Israelis can settle something and bury the hatchet in the Palestinians' back. That is unsustainable. That's not going to happen. And finally, he says, non-solving this situation is not a solution as it has created four Palestinian failed states. What are these four faith Palestinian states? I will tell you from Cordesman. Gaza with Hamas. Second, West Bank with Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority and Hamas, by the way, are rivals, political rivals. Number three, Israeli Arabs. These are Arabs who live in Israel and look at this population, see how they are divided. If you look at, generally look at today's population mix, West Bank is about 3 million people, Palestinian, mostly Muslim, some Christian, 3 million people. Gaza, a little over 2 million people. And then you have Israeli Arabs. These are Arabs who live in Israel, who have the right to vote. Not all the rights that Jews have, for example, under, under a law passed by the Knesset, Israeli Arabs cannot criticize the Israeli state, whereas in Israel, anybody can criticize the Palestinians. That is also from Cordesman's paper. So this is 3 plus 2, 5 plus 2, 7. It's almost 7 million Palestinians under three different entities. So he says each one of these is a failed state. So Gaza, Gaza under Hamas is a failed state, number one. Second, West Bank under Palestinian Authority is a failed state. Number three, Israeli Arabs are a failed state. Fourth, he says, East Jerusalem is a failed state. And fifth, and this is his most stunning conclusion. He says, if this goes on, this could create a fifth failed state as the Israeli politics has declined from an effective democracy to something beginning to approach chaocracy. So this is Cordesman's final turn of the knife. With that, I conclude this rather long episode of Karta Clutter, but you know it's a big news day. And we look at other aspects of the situation as we go as, as we go on. I suspect for most of the rest of this week, we will stay with the Israel Middle East story.